Um, uh, let's go back and talk about Strat for the first the first uh, sure. years for a little bit, and then then I want to go over and talk about Charlie because where this whole where this root came from, this that's growing all these trees and all of this wonderful comedy. But Stratford, you were at Stratford in the opening season. The very beginning. I was e even aware of Stratford before it started because uh, I had worked with a man called Herbert Scott in London. I was in London and, and Guthrie was around and I saw wonderful, p funny plays he did with Northern Irish theatre companies. And so I, I certainly knew about him. You and were working in London or seeing things in London? I was working in London. And how did you get, sorry, how did you get the job in London? I'm, I'm still back. I, I, I finished Spring Thaw in 1950. And I said, I was my mother-in-law who said, you, you've got to get over to Europe and, and see what's going on. And I said, okay. And the book passage on the Georgic, which was a ship that had been under the Red Sea for five years during World War II. And they dug it up and they, it was kind of a very sparse, luxury liner. I landed in London and I thought I would go and see A Street Cat May Desire. I'd just seen it in Toronto with Anthony Quinn in the Marlon Brando role. Very good. So I went to see, and because I knew Bernie Braden was in it, playing Mitch. And some a strange kind of Australian who went to school in, in New York called Bonner Colino was playing the Stanley part. And Vivian Lee was doing Blanche Dubois. So I go to see the play, and I think it's terrible. It's directed by Laurence Olivier. And I think it's, it, Vivian Lee is just awful. She can't even get the X. She said, they told me to take a street corps named Desire and transfer it one. It sounded Irish to me. And I thought, oh, God. And Bernie was okay, but he was wrong for the part because Bernie's a little guy and bitch, Mitch has got to be big. So I go backstage anyway, dutifully, and, and Bernie says, uh, uh, this is Danny Mann who's come to take over because Vivian's going to Hollywood to do the film with Gadge, Mr. Kazan, <laughs> Elijah Kazan. And I said, hi. He says, uh, you American? I said, no, I'm Canadian. He says, what the hell's the difference? Actually, Danny Mann had worked in Toronto with the Theatre of Action left-wing group in the 30s. So he said, come back tomorrow morning. and Because and, uh, we're losing uh, John, somebody was going to do a film of Tom Brown's school days or something. He played the young collector. Do you know the play mm -hmm. that she mm -hmm. tries to seduce him when he's trying to collect money for the evening star? So I thought, oh, I said, well, I, I, yeah, 10.30, okay, I'll, I'll be there. I go out to dinner with Bernie, he's very generous, and he says, my friend Bonner Colino has a radio show, and we have a writer called Doug Haskins from Vancouver, and it, it, it ain't working out. And he, I said, well, I've just finished doing Spring Thaw. He says, you write comedy? Well, I did in Spring Thaw, so I stayed, stayed up all night in this hotel in Park Lane. I can't, so I can't remember my own name, but it's a, a, a rich hotel. And I stayed there all night and rewrote this script. This is my first night in London. And I think, God, I've got to be at the Old Witch Theatre at 10 o'clock or 10.30 or something. So I wrap up the thing and hand it in, and I take a cab over to the theatre. There are 70 guys outside the theatre trying for this one little part. It's a good part, though. So the stage manager comes out and says, uh, are there any Americans here? So I put my hand up, because that's what the director said. And there were two other guys. One was Lyndon Brooks' son, an English actor who'd been to school in New York for two years. And the other was a genuine American. And he said, told the rest of 68 guys to go home. So we go in and read, and I, I got the part. I'm in London, less than 24 hours, I have a BBC series to write and a part in a West End play. So I stayed two years. Who wouldn't? Would you call yourself lucky? As well as talented, hmm? but lucky? Lucky. Lucky. Luck is really more important than talent, I'm afraid. But you can't have one without the other. You can't have You can't have one. the talent without the luck, and you can't have the luck without the talent. 
Yeah, I guess it's a chance to prove. Luck, luck gives you a chance. Anyway, so what was what, it for a Canadian, a Canadian, young Canadian lad to be in London going to the Aldrich Theatre and performing? The thing I remember most was the rationing. It was only five years after the war. There was sweets rationing. There was petrol rationing. There was meat rationing. There was sugar rationing. There was everything. So you go into the candy store and you can only buy certain yeah. candies? or. Mm. And you go to a restaurant and they say, I'm sorry, you can't have the veal cutlet uh, tonight because well, there isn't any? Well, a lot of Indian restaurants around. I don't know what they put in there, but it sure tasted good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the point is I got to be aware of Guthrie. And I was told that Guthrie came out. We were doing, I was in, then I was in the New Play Society doing Canadian plays. Remember Canadian plays? Yes, yes was because, uh, because of the success of Spring Thaw that Maver Moore said, next year we're going to do all Canadian plays. And we started with a play of Maver's. We did a play of Andrew Allen's, a play of Tommy Tweed's, a play of John Coulter, Riel, I directed it badly, and a play of Mr. Sinclair's, and a play of Nathan Cohen's, which got badly panned by all the critics. Nathan Cohen was the critic for the stars, yes? He yes. Was. he was. And what, what was Nathan Cohen's play? Called Blue is for Morning was about a, a mine in uh, Cape Breton, where he comes from. He's a Glace Bay guy. Anyway, Guthrie went and they had a little meeting with these people in Stratford, the committee. So this is the New Play Society Well, that Guthrie no, met? No. Dora May, Tom Patterson, who came back to Stratford from the army and said, we've got to do something about Stratford, because there's a Stratford in England. Why can't there be the same thing here in Canada? And he went to Olivier, who was in New York doing the Caesar and Cleopatra and Antony and Cleopatra at the same time. And Olivier said, I, I can't, dear boy. I'm sorry. I'm very busy. So Dora Maver Moore heard he was looking around. She said, you've got to get to Ron Guthrie. So he went to England and he said, yeah. Guthrie came over, no luggage, a nylon shirt in a paper bag, spoke to the committee and said, uh, if you want to do Shakespeare, good, really, well, quite significant, be grateful. But if you want to make money, why don't you just go to New York and hire a bunch of chorus girls who can kick themselves in the forehead and do, do musicals? Yeah. Prophetic? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But instead we did that. We, oh, it was and did great. you audition for the first year at Stratford? Did you? I auditioned in an interesting way because he said, I've heard about you. Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't care. I'll, I'll sweep the stage. He said, right. So he cast me as Bertram in All's Well That Ends Well. That's the, male, the juvenile lead. And what was it like to be directed by Tyrone Guthrie? Oh, incredible. Now, I, I was also directed by him in New York. With the, full of method actors, because he didn't do any method directing. He just, he just gave you a picture. He said, I want, I want you to do it. This is all done in your bedroom before you go down to breakfast. You get so excited. But I don't, he was just, he was a poet. He would give you a, a, an image. And how was Tyrone Guthrie with the method actors? I don't, he said, um, uh, uh, Elia Kazan said about Guthrie, uh, he, he substitutes emotion for locomotion, tells you where to go. And I had this thing, I said, what, Tony, what have you got? He says, just keep moving around the stage. You know, find your own emotional truth, you know. So he didn't speak to what you were feeling or trying to find as an actor. No, you emotionally. Need to find it yourself. You go and do and that. And I think he was also afraid of a lot of emotion. Great, great comic director. But he loved tragedy. But I, I, I had a strange, strange kind of relation. I was kind of like his adopted son. I could be very cheeky to him. And, and uh, I, I, I don't know. And he sent me, I mean, one word from him, he said, you have rather a paucity of gesture. 
that sent me away from Toronto and television and all that stuff to, to the Bristol Old Vic to learn my trade in a British rep company. To learn uh, theatrical reflections, <laughs> so to speak. How to use my hands. You know, I mean, I was based, I was a radio actor who sort of went, wandered into television. I had a lot to learn. And the first year in the tent, the first years in the tent, what was that like? Well, uh, we didn't know if it was going to work. First of all, the newspaper, the Stratford Beacon Herald, was against it, dead against the idea of having a festival. Why? They didn't think it would work. They thought that they were taking a terrible chance. Well, they were being very Canadian. And, and uh, you know, it was a five-week festival. But Guinness and Irene Worth and Douglas Campbell were our guests, and they were willing to take a chance, so why shouldn't we? And the opening night of Richard III, I was playing Lovell, who's nothing, you know, a bit. But Guthrie chose me to conduct the battle. Uh, I was on Richard III's side, and Bill Hutt was the, Brackenbury was the other, the anti-Richard forces. So we met center stage, and we both had our swords up like this, and it was my job to decide when to go and start the battle. And opening night, so nervous, everybody was scared blue. And uh, it was hot and humid, and we saw bodies fainting in the audience and being passed along to the St. John's Ambulance guy at the end of the row, like a hot dog at a football game. And I saw this, but I saw that the audience were not looking at the body passing. They were looking at me. I thought, okay, we're going to be okay. Ta -da! And we started the battle. Wow. Mind you, we got sort of mixed reviews, you know. Guinness really? got mixed reviews. New York Times. It was the next night when we did the unknown All's Well That Ends Well, we got the raves. Right. And what didn't they like about the... Uh... I don't know. I thought it was wonderful and exciting and everything. <laughs> and was it full? Packed? Oh, yeah. And hot. Yeah. My God. And in those days, the people of Stratford could afford to go to their theater. I don't know if they can now. That's the sad thing. Half price tickets. Because Guthrie, bucks. the first day of rehearsal, no, the day before their first, said, You are going to dinner tonight with the Stratford family, all of you, because this is their theater. There's no such thing as a national theater. Theater has roots in a community, and this is Stratford's theater, and you're going to make them feel part, and they always did. They always felt they owned their theater. Not so Stratford, Connecticut. The theater guild moved in from outside and ignored the local people and was an import, and it's gone. Right. Yes, it has gone, hasn't it? But Stratford oh still has its roots. I'm sorry that the prices are so high. And you played a five-week run the first year. Yeah. Two shows in rep. Yeah, that's it. And how do the audiences hold? They help because uh, we, uh, the Canadian critics, <laughs> raved. I mean, Herbie Whitaker was, was sort of the chief one. I don't know if Nathan, I don't remember what Nathan said. Didn't matter. It would be interesting to go back and see what he said. Because, you know, the critics with a new theater can kill it, you know. Yeah. Enough bad press, no one will go and not see yeah. the Enterprise. So. 